One of the things you can do with plasma is try to make energy. Let's look at the closest operating fusion, nuclear fusion reactor to us right now. The sun. The sun takes hydrogen and it eventually converts it to helium. Now the reaction that the sun's doing is a very difficult one. In fact, this first step, most people would say, is just plain impossible. You're actually taking a proton and turning it into a neutron. It's not supposed to happen. It's an extremely slow reaction. But you know what? The sun has a lot of time. And it has an enormous mass. And it has enormous gravity confining this plasma together. In fact, those are the things you need to be able to get a fusion reaction to work. You need density. And the density of the sun is 100 times that of water. You think, oh, it's like a flame. I can put my hand through a flame. Right, right. You can't put your hand through the sun. Right. If you see some science fiction show and it shows somehow they're able to get a ship to go through a star, but man, it crashes on the Earth. The opposite, sun's 10 times denser. You're not getting through the sun. It also, besides density, needs to be hot. And the sun is 15 million degrees. Thinking that steel melts at maybe 2,500 degrees, that's really, really, really super hot. The other thing you need is confinement. The sun does that by gravity. We can't do that here on Earth. The size of the Earth is, oh, about like the size of my fingertip right here compared to the size of the sun. So this kind of gravity confinement system, you're not going to cut a tear down on Earth. What we want to do on Earth to make fusion is first use a much simpler reaction. Deuterium, a isotope of hydrogen, which has one proton, the yellow, and one neutron, the blue, with another isotope of hydrogen called tritium, which still has one proton and two neutrons. This is the easiest fusion reaction to take place. Notice there are a couple disadvantages of it. Tritium does not naturally occur. It's radioactive. It has a half-life of 12 years. However, we can make tritium fairly easily out of lithium, an element which we have a very large supply on the planet. So if I take tritium and deuterium and I get it hot enough, that 15 million degrees that the sun was, you think, oh, wow, that's really, really super hot. Well, we can do better than that on Earth. The temperature doesn't seem to be as big of a problem. We can get to 100 million degrees. We get up to those temperatures. Fusion takes place, and it turns into helium and a neutron. This side, the helium and the neutron, have less mass because of the way the helium is bound compared to the deuterium and tritium. Helium is a much more stable nuclei. We have rearranged nuclear bonds into a more stable state. And in this process, you give off energy. How is that energy manifested? Well, the deuterium and tritium over here have to move fairly fast to combine. After all, they're both positively charged. They have to overcome that to be able to, to combine. They're moving. But man, over here, the helium and the neutron, they're moving a thousand times faster. That's where the heat comes from. The energy of the products, the speed of the products, is much higher than the speed of the reactants. Energy is released. This reaction is good because it's easy. It's not the best reaction because of two things. First, we do have to use a radioactive fuel. Not tremendously dangerous, not long half-life, but something that means the technology to do it has to be very good. Can't let any of that tritium get out. Tritium turns to tritiated water. We're mostly water. It's not good biologically. And this pesky neutron. Neutrons are what make things radioactive. 
So the vessel itself you do the fusion reaction in will become radioactive. The half-lives are not enormous. It can be eventually buried as probably even low-level waste, but it can't be repaired by people for many years because it will be too radioactive. So if you make a fusion reactor and something needs maintenance or being broken, it will have to be done robotically. Not impossible. After all, the inside of fission reactors has this same issue. And they work very well. The nice thing about fusion, though, is there is a future. Here are some other reactions. The first one is the same one we were just talking about, deuterium and tritium. But you could just use two deuteriums. Now, this is better because you don't start with a radioactive fuel, and half the time you don't end up with neutrons. The other half you do. So while this reaction is better in several ways, it still has some of the disadvantages. Also, unfortunately, this reaction is much harder to do. It takes a higher temperature. There is a fusion reaction, sort of the uh, uh, holy grail of fusion reactions, where you can take boron and a proton, and all you get out is helium. No radioactive fuel, no neutrons to make your device radioactive. Unfortunately, it also takes extremely high temperatures. And while there's an optimistic timeline of sort of when maybe we will do these, it's certainly not probably the timeline of when you'll see power plants based on this. And perhaps even this third reaction here is um, beyond our technology. But as long as we're learning about fusion, there are alternatives, potential alternatives, that can give us a ex inexhaustible supply of energy in a simpler technology in the respect that it isn't radioactive. Let's talk a minute about how to actually make them take place. Remember, we need density, temperature, confinement time. The good thing about plasmas is that you can use a magnetic field to move them around. Take a look at this demo. There's a current going from one electrode to the other, and that current is actually the plasma. If you remember some uh, basic physics, you put your thumb in the direction of the current, your fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field. A moving current gives you a magnetic field. And since a plasma is a moving current, you can see if I put a magnet up to this, I can actually bend the plasma around. I can confine the plasma, not using a solid material, because it would melt, but I can confine it using a magnetic field. Let's take a look at how this might work. You see, if I just have a cylinder, and I've got electrons and ions running around on it, they go any which way they want. But if I put a magnetic field, as shown here along the axis, the charged particles will actually spiral around the magnetic field. And this is great, because now I can keep them confined. I can keep them away from the walls, which they might otherwise melt. Take this shape and you say, wow, this is fantastic, uh, except for the ends. All this plasma is still hitting the ends. So why not take those ends and put them together into a donut? Wonderful. Now we have no end. And you can do that by putting these blue coils around, toroidal field coils, and that makes this magnetic field and all the particles follow it. Sort of. As soon as a magnetic field line starts to turn, though, into this circle, it causes the particles to drift, either up to the top or to the bottom. And if they do that, all of a sudden we're hitting the walls again. We can't hit the walls. So, we need to do one more thing. We need to give the plasma a twist. We can do that in a couple ways. A stellarator does it by having an actual magnetic coil that's twisted. A tokamak does it 
by having the current pass through the plasma and create that twist. And you can see that what you end up with is another magnetic field going around this way. So your resultant field is this twisted magnetic field in a donut. And that shape is a minimum energy state. What do you mean, minimum energy state? It's like a ball rolling downhill. The ball will settle in the bottom of the hill all by itself. So does this minimum energy state really exist? Yes, look right here. Here's a picture of a solar flare. And notice how the solar flare twists around. And if we imagine it connecting back inside the sun, makes the donut shape. Nature knows that this is a minimum energy state. Unfortunately, people figured it out as well. If you put the plasma in this state, it will be confined. So all we have to do is figure out how to make this on Earth. The device I'm standing in front of is the Hybrid Illinois device for research and application. It is a fusion confinement device. And you can see the large blue coils are the toroidal field coils. An enormous current goes through there, producing a magnetic field which holds the plasma together. The thing is that because it's curved, just having these coils isn't good enough. You have to have a twist. This is a hybrid device because it's both a stellarator and a tokamak. And that is caused because it has more coils that are hard to see. It has a helical winding. You can kind of get the idea of it by looking at these cooling lines. Do you see how they go in a, in a helical direction? It wraps as an angle around the machine. Inside this first layer are two more coils that wrap in a helix around the device. This is how we can make that twist and keep the plasma confined. A tokamak is a Russian acronym for toroidal confinement magnetic. And a tokamak makes the twist in a different way. In the very center of this device is a five ton leg of iron. And it's connected to these, each individual post is one ton of solid iron. And that makes a transformer the red coils at the very bottom can get a pulsed current that go through them. And when it does, just like the can crusher, it creates a current in the plasma itself. The plasma is the wire. And that wire is going to get hot and it's going to exert magnetic pressure. And as a tokamak, that produces the twist and heats the plasma. So, this device can be run as a stellarator in steady state or as a tokamak for a brief moment but getting to much higher and hotter temperatures. This device came from Germany. We were fortunate enough to be able to get it here at Illinois because they built the world's largest stellarator, a billion dollar device that would take much more than even just this building size to hold. On this device, not only will we learn more about various aspects of fusion energy, but we will also use it for many different types of applications. We have a star, and we invite the world to put something in it and to learn what we can about a confined plasma's interactions with the materials. A fusion device needs confinement, and we get that from the magnetic fields. But we also have to get the plasma hot enough this plasma and this device is not going to make much fusion, and that's fine, it's a research tool. It needs to be much bigger to be able to do that. But still, we need to be able to get energy into the plasma. And just like the RF plasma chamber with the coils in it, we can do something very similar here, pumping microwave energy or radio frequency energy in, which will heat up the plasma. This whole process takes a lot of energy. The transformers you see behind me actually allow us to use 2 million watts 
And that's not just for a brief period of time, that's steady state. This device for its energy input is two megawatts. It's like having 20,100 watt light bulbs all on at the same time, putting power into the device. I think it's something around three or 4% of all of the electrical energy on campus when this is running. In addition, getting it here was quite a chore because uh, the total weight of all of these components, remember if this stuff is solid iron, is 70 tons. It arrived in the fall of 2014, and as we're filming, this is in the middle of 2015. The hope is by the end of the year, we're going to have plasmas in this device and use it not just for research, but for education. Even today, having uh, students work on the machine in its assembly phases is a fantastic learning experience. Hydrogen glows pink. And to give yourself some framework, here you're going into the vessel, and here you're coming out around the side. You're looking in the edge of a donut. If I drew the view, imagine I've got this shape going around, right? Here's the center line, and this would be the other cross section of it on the other side. But we're just looking this way. Our eye sees the inner side here, right? and we're looking through like that. Here, you see the plasma, but it doesn't necessarily look like it's somehow held together. I see pink everywhere. Well, let's put a certain filter on this. A filter that doesn't look at the hydrogen, because after all, we really have hydrogen everywhere. It's just much denser in the middle. But something that gets rid of all the hydrogen light and just looks at the impurities, the impurities that would be trapped and not able to get into this magnetic bottle. If I press the button here, this shows the actual magnetic bottle. I just think it's an awesome picture. Once again, you're looking through the edge of a donut. It shirts back around that way, and here it comes outside. And why do you see this bright halo around the edge? Think about it if I had a frosted glazed donut. And I was looking at it, my eye, right like this. If I look right through the edge, I'll see a lot of frosting, glazing. That's this part on the outside. If I look right through here, I'm going to see all the frosting on the inside where the donut hole came out, and that's what you see right in here. This is a wonderful picture of this magnetic bottle held within the physical walls of the device. And you might say, well, wait, Professor Ruzik, you said you have magnetic confinement. Why do you need a physical bottle at all? Well, we have to keep out the air. Remember, this is made of hydrogen, and it's not made of very much hydrogen. Basically, it's a vacuum vessel. You pump all the gas out, and then you put just a little bit of hydrogen in, you turn it into a plasma, you confine it, and the very last thing you need to do is you need to heat it up. And you got a variety of tools. You could just pass a current through it, like a toaster. You could compress it by upping the magnetic fields. You could use uh, radial frequency or other electromagnetic waves to try to actually make resonances with the plasma that's going around and heat it that way. Or you could actually throw in neutral atoms that are moving at a very high velocity. And once they get into the plasma, they become ionized and are trapped by the magnetic field. This gives you density, temperature, and confinement time. And as long as I have these three things and their product is high enough, temperature has to be at least 100 million degrees, density and confinement, as long as these two multiply together, I could have short confinement and higher density or less density and higher confinement. If I get that, I can make sustained fusion reactions, which will give us net energy 
which could, of course, someday produce electricity. That's what you need to know about fusion.